Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's exactly 0800 GMT on Tuesday, the 23rd of August, 2022. Welcome to this virtual policy dialogue on sustainable debt management in Africa. This is a side event to the 8th Tokyo International Conference on African Development. In short, it's TCAD 8. And the first thing I would like to do is to mention that there is translation in five languages. Click on the globe icon on your Zoom page and select your language of choice. We have English, French, Portuguese, Arabic, and Japanese. After more than a year of tackling the impact of COVID-19, Africa's hopes of recovery from the pandemic have been dealt a blow by the ongoing war in Ukraine. Food and energy prices are rising and so is inflation. Add to other pressures caused by the impact of climate change, national programs to tackle rising poverty, and the need to invest in life transforming development projects, and you are left with countries finding a remedy in borrowing, borrowing, and borrowing. Across the continent, the debt burden runs into billions of dollars, and it's rising. 15 countries have been rated to be at high risk of debt distress. Seven countries are already in debt distress. What next for these countries? This and many other questions are on the table today as we discuss what needs to be done to tackle Africa's growing debt challenges. And this virtual seminar is organized jointly by the African Development Bank and the government of Japan. It brings together government officials, donor international experts, together with those from the African Development Bank, representatives from the International Monetary Fund, IMF, are here. And so are civil society organizations, rating agencies, the media, and members of the general public. So let me give you a guided tour of today's event. We have opening statements from the president of the African Development Bank, Dr. Akinumi Adeshine, and the vice minister for finance, for International Affairs in Japan's Ministry of Finance, Mr. Masato Kanda. After hearing from those two opening statements, we'll then set the stage for today's discussion. And to do so, we have the African Development Bank's Acting Chief Economist and Vice President Professor Kevin Urama. It will be followed by Mr. Guillaume Chabert, who is the Deputy Director of Strategy, Policy, and review department at the International Monetary Fund, that's the IMF. I will then hand over to my colleague, Victoria Chisala. She's the acting director of strategy and operational department to moderate the first of two panel sessions. That session dives into the heart of the matter and Victoria has a powerful lineup of panelists ready to share experiences of their countries that have accessed or are still trying to access international initiatives to tackle debt challenges. She will also tell you how you can send her your questions and comments for the panel. So please get set wherever you are. And I can say we've been joined by hundreds of people who are tuning in from various parts of the world. At the end of that session and after fast paced start of the day, it will be time for a much deserved break for a generous 10 minutes. When we return, We'll go straight into the second panel discussion that will take you to the next step of debt sustainability. What does the future hold for Africa? Moderating that session will be my colleague, Dr. Desiree Venkatashalam, the Director of Resource Mobilization and Partnerships. He will be bringing together an amazing coalition of government rating agencies, civil society organizations, and the private sector, and of course, your comments. And after that, it will be time to wrap up things in style with Takaki Nomoto, the executive director of the African Development Bank. And now with that panoramic view of the day's proceedings, let's get started. And uh, before I cue in the next um, item, if you are on Twitter, please, you can follow this debate at TCAD, hashtag TCAD8. And please, let's get uh, talking. Let me now pave way for an opening statement from the African, from the president of the African Development Bank, Dr. Akinomi Adeshina.
Your Excellency, Shunichi Shizuki, Minister of Finance of Japan, Excellencies, Governors, and Alternate Governors of the African Development Bank Group, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this high-level dialogue on sustainable debt management in Africa. On the margins of TICAD 8, organized by the African Development Bank and the Government of Japan. Once again, I would like to extend my deepest condolences to you, Minister Suzuki, and the entire government and people of Japan on the tragic assassination of the former Prime Minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe. Shinzo Abe was a great friend of Africa. He gave exemplary leadership and moved the partnership between Japan and Africa to great heights through the Tokyo International Conference on the African Development TCAD. Africa misses Shinzo Abe. The African Development Bank misses Shinzo Abe. I miss Shinzo Abe. May his soul rest in peace. Your Excellences, without any doubt, the COVID-19 pandemic caused major economic shocks that have put great and unbearable fiscal burdens on African economies, with GDP growth rate declining to minus 1.6% in 2020, the lowest growth rate in more than two decades. While growth has recovered to 6.9% in 2021, albeit projected to decline to 4.1% due to the new challenges from Russian war in Ukraine, the effects of the pandemic continues to constrain fiscal space of many African countries. African countries will need at least $424 billion by 2022 to cope with these effects. The situation is made worse by climate change and is costing the continent $7 to $15 billion per year, which is projected to rise to $50 billion by 2030. The fiscal space for response to these massive exogenous shocks has been very different between developed economies and Africa. Of the total $17 trillion in fiscal measures implemented globally, almost $13.5 trillion was by G20 developed economies, and $1.8 trillion by G20 emerging markets. The total value of fiscal support by African countries was only $89.5 billion, and that only represented 3.5% of its GDP and 0.56% of global fiscal interventions. Africa lost a lot of financial inflows due to the pandemic. Foreign direct investment declined from $47.1 billion in 2019 to $39.8 billion in 2020. African countries experienced an outflow of $19 billion in portfolio investments in 2020, compared to a net inflow of $14.5 billion in 2019, as investors simply moved out to safer markets. Remittance flows declined from $87 billion to $83.4 billion. Due to these and other challenges, total Africa public debt as a percentage of GDP increased to 70% in 2021. This is about double from 36% in 2010. Of particular concern is a rapid change in the structure of debt, with private creditors now accounting for 40% of Africa's total external debt. The Debt Service Suspension Initiative the DSSI has helped to reduce liquidity challenges, with 38 eligible African countries benefiting from more than $13 billion in savings from debt service moratoriums. However, the debt service moratoriums represented only 25% of total debt service payments of countries for 2020, 
and 40.1% for 2021. The G20 Common Framework by the G20 and the Paris Club was designed to address the insolvency and illiquidity issues. Well, so far, it has now been able to be concluded in the three participating countries, and those are Chad, Ethiopia, and Zambia. This is due to lack of creditor coordination, information sharing, and procedural transparency, and limited private sector participation. The $630 billion special drawing rights, the SDRs by the International Monetary Fund, IMF, allocated $33.2 billion to Africa, or just 5% of the total allocation. African leaders have called for a rechanneling of $100 billion of SDRs to Africa, and that a portion of this should be channeled through the African Development Bank. As a AAA rated financial institution, the African Development Bank can leverage these SDRs by four times and deliver larger volumes of financing to Africa. The bank continues to work with the IMF and other willing donor countries on this rechanneling. We are delighted that the United Kingdom has stated its readiness to provide the SDRs through the African Development Bank. We hope that Japan and other SDR donor countries will also positively consider this request of the African heads of state. It will go a long way in supporting Africa in reducing its debt challenges. The 16th replenishment of the African Development Fund, the ADF, presents a great opportunity to provide much needed concessional financing for Africa's low income countries and fragile states. I wish to thank the government of Japan for being such a great supporter of the ADF. We look to you again this year for strong support for the ADF replenishment through more donor grants and concessional donor loans. Thank you. The ADF is developing plans to leverage its $25 billion in equity to potentially raise $33 billion from capital markets in long-term low interest rate resources that will better support ADF countries. The ADF market access will reduce debt vulnerabilities. Now think of the following. If the ADF countries that have gone to the capital markets to raise euro bonds worth $30 billion and 10 billion euros had come to the African Development Bank Group for financing, they would have saved $22 billion and 7.8 billion euros in interest payments alone. So, the ADF market access will not add to debt. Rather, it will help to reduce debt and debt vulnerability. To further address the debt challenges, African Development Bank is now taking several actions. First, the bank approved a three-year multi-dimensional debt action plan for the management and mitigation of debt distress with the goal of supporting countries to make debt work better for Africa. Second, the bank approved a five-year strategy for economic governance in Africa, SEGA, which includes debt management and transparency as a core pillar. This will help to strengthen the capacity of countries to formulate and, of course, implement debt policy and medium-term debt strategy frameworks, ensure more prudent debt contracting and management, enhance debt statistics, recording, monitoring, and reporting, and promote the use of non-debt 
and innovative financing instruments. Third, this year, the bank approved the sustainable borrowing policy to guide its lending to countries while enhancing debt management and transparency and strengthening partnerships and coordination. Finally, in June of this year, the bank approved the establishment of a public financial management academy. The academy is dedicated to building national capacity in the entire public financial management cycle through structured training, policy dialogue, and technical assistance. Ladies and gentlemen, Africa cannot run up a hill with a backpack full of sand on its back. Together, let us advance on debt restructuring. Together, let us advance economic governance reforms. And together, let us advance sustainable debt management. The African Development Bank stands fully ready to play its part. Thank you all very much and welcome again. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, you've just joined us. We've been watching the president of the African Development Bank, Dr. Kinumi Adeshina, painting for us that clear picture of Africa's debt situation and what's needed to tackle the continent's debt challenges. And now let's watch and listen to Japan's Vice Minister for International Affairs, Mr. Masato Kanda. Thank you, President Adeshina, Honorable Ministers, distinguished speakers and guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honor to address you all at this high-level policy dialogue on sustainable debt management. I'd like to thank AFDB staff for organizing this event. Indeed, debt management is one of the most imminent challenges that African countries face, and addressing it has been Japan's high priority. We are very pleased to officially support this important side event of the day. Africa has tremendous potential for economic growth with its rich natural and human resources. Japan has been a long-standing partner with Africa to realize such potential, supporting Africa in many dimensions, particularly agriculture, food security, and resilience against natural disasters. The upcoming TICAT 8 will provide an excellent opportunity for Japan and Africa to achieve balanced and inclusive growth with African countries in the driver's seat. In order for Africa to sustainably mobilize financial resources in these important development areas, it needs to successfully address one formidable challenge, the growing risk of debt vulnerabilities. We have witnessed the COVID-19 pandemic significantly affect the debt situations of African countries. The G20 and the Paris Club immediately stepped in and implemented the debt service suspension initiative from May 2020 to the end of 2021. This initiative helped African countries address acute short-term liquidity needs. However, it was not designed to address the root causes of debt vulnerabilities. In this context, the G20 and the Paris Club launched the common framework. It is highly valued as the first ever historic initiative of debt treatment that involves both Paris Club and the non-Paris Club creators. However, it is taking a very long time with only little progress so far. Borrower countries are frustrated, I know. Meanwhile, today's rising food and energy prices caused by Russia's aggression against Ukraine directly hit African countries and are making their debt problems more challenging. Against this background, debt vulnerabilities in Africa need to be addressed as a matter of urgency. So what should we do to address this issue? My answer is to ensure that all three stakeholders will fulfill their respective responsibilities for securing debt sustainability and transparency. First, creditors should cooperate with African countries to secure debt sustainability and transparency. To begin with, when financing African countries, creditors always need to consider borrowers payment capacity and appropriately adjust the concessionality 
of their financing. The G20 and Paris Club creditors are tasked to implement the common framework swiftly and transparently. To do so, they should properly share their lending data with the IMF and the World Bank, constructively negotiate within creditor committees, and provide a fair and comparable debt treatment. In parallel, creditor countries need to give certainty to borrowers by clarifying the common framework process and the time limits. Creditor countries can facilitate this process through cooperating with African countries in strengthening their borrowing data through data data reconciliation. Japan has been leading on this and is determined to carry through this initiative. In fact, Japan shared our loan by loan lending data with the World Bank in 2020, which facilitated the reconciliation process and successfully closed the data gap of 1.1 billion US dollars for Sudan and 220 million dollars for Zimbabwe. Japan calls upon other credit countries to follow suit to shed light on the actual data situations of African countries. Second, African countries themselves need to demonstrate their full commitment to improve data sustainability and transparency. Let's be cautious about taking the non-concessional borrowing beyond their payment capacity and opaque financing, including collateralized debt. Let's continue to work on enhancing the capacity to manage debt and improve debt transparency. In this context, I would also like to stress the importance of quality infrastructure investment. It will help countries raise economic efficiency in view of the life cycle costs, build resilience against natural disasters, and ensure both project level financial sustainability and macro level debt sustainability. We believe it will assist Africa to achieve sustainable growth and development, including debt sustainability. Given those multi-dimensional benefits, Japan has and will continue to promote quality infrastructure investment through many ways, including face-to-face -face policy dialogue and providing financing. With these efforts, investors will be assured of Africa's future economic development and will be willing to invest in Africa even further. Third, IFRs such as AFDB play a pivotal role in improving the data situations of African countries. We look forward to their further support for African countries in implementing economic and fiscal reforms and strengthening capacity for data management and transparency. We also call upon IFIs to reach out to and urge credit countries to cooperate more to address debt vulnerabilities. Japan supports IFIs work on Africa's debt issues through multilateral and bilateral trust funds. These are the three points which are crucial to address debt vulnerabilities. All stakeholders, including credit countries, African countries, and IFIs should work together and let Africa unlock its potential. At today's seminar, we welcome your views on how we can improve the common framework implementation and what Africa expects from visitor countries. We would highly appreciate if you could share your experiences from reforming efforts and capacity building activities. I hope that today's discussions and upcoming Ticket 8 will provide useful inputs for African countries to achieve sustainable economic growth. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Japan's Vice Minister for International Affairs, Mr. Masato Kande. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, just to remind you, this is a virtual policy dialogue on sustainable debt management in Africa. It's organized by the African Development Bank, and this is in the run-up to the 8th Tokyo International Conference on African Development, that is TICAD 8 in Tunis, the capital of Tunisia. And if you joined us via Zoom, remember there is translation in five languages. Click on the globe icon on your Zoom page and select your language of choice there. We have English, French, Portuguese, Arabic, and Japanese. On Twitter, we are at hashtag a -A ticket 8 hashtag ticket 8 That is on Twitter. Let's get that debate and conversation going on. And after watching those two remarkable speeches, first by the president of the African Development Bank, Dr. Deshina, who left us with that picture of someone going uphill with a backpack of sand, tough task, and the urgency in what Japan's Vice Minister for International Affairs, Mr. Masato Kanda, shared with us, it's now time to look into debt vulnerabilities, the trends and challenges. Let's welcome Professor Kevin Urama.
Thank you uh, very much, Solomon. Let me just share my screen and Okay. Dr. Akumi Adesina, President of the African Development Bank Group. Mr. Masato Kanda, Vice Minister of Finance for International Affairs, Ministry of Finance in Japan. Mr. Tahi Hamid Nguilin, Minister of Finance, Chad. Mr. Rob, uh, Rigobert Roger Andley, Minister of Finance, Budget and, Port and Public Portfolio in Congo. Honorable ministers, excellencies, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to present to you today a bird's eye view on a very important subject, which is the debt situation on the continent and how we could go about sustainable debt management. So here on this slide is a, the presentation sequence I'll follow. First, an introduction of debt vulnerabilities in Africa, its implications, the debt resolution that is ongoing at the moment, and the challenges and opportunities we see and how they can be improved. Then the key questions that the government of Japan and the African Development Bank, who are the organizers of this particular forum, would like us to dig deep into and come out with solutions in order to improve the debt situation on the continent. Then I will also offer a few recommendations from my side and some concluding remarks. First, we all agree that there is a, an elevated debt levels on the continent, both the president of the bank and minister um, of Japan, uh, vice minister of Japan have already painted that picture for us. And this is in a situation where there's a dire need for resources for economic recovery on the continent due to several factors, some internal, some external to the countries themselves. So we see in this graph a continued rise in the debt to GDP ratios of countries. And this is keeping in mind that that was the hippic after um, uh, uh, just before this decade where we're seeing this continued rise. I make three points here on this slide. First, the rise on, in debt and debt vulnerabilities in Africa has not been caused solely by COVID-19. So we have structural issues. We have also external global financing architecture related issues that has continued to condition African countries to depend on debt financing and also having challenges for repayments of debt. I will touch on a few of them as we go forward. But we see that rapid rise from 36% to 71.4% in debt, Africa's gross public debt since 2010 uh, up to 2020. This rapid increase saw some slowdown due to some interventions that already has been pointed at the, uh, that I'm also going to talk about in this presentation. But these were temporary liquidity support measures to countries. And because they are temporary, now some of them have elapsed, the debt challenge has begun to rise again. And not only that, we have overlapping challenges that are stemmed from COVID recovery, the increasing climate change impacts, heightened security spending, inflation, and global market volatilities that are set to continue to drive these debt uh, vulnerabilities up for the continent. And this poses risks both for the borrower and for the creditor because the debt defaults are looming very large. So we estimate that debt to GDP ratio may rise to be by between 10 to 15% in the short to medium, medium term. And another worry is the higher cost and increasing cost of debt servicing on the continent. So as at the end of 2019 and 2020, we saw that over 18% of total government revenue was used to service debt on the continent. For some countries, about five countries on this continent, uh, that ratio well, that percentage is up to 
that's a big challenge. And you see that in many countries, it was also more than 14%, as you see in the second bullet point there. And with the expiration of those temporary liquidity measures that were put in place to address COVID-19, while the global headwinds are increasing, not decreasing, the, uh, the challenges of debt vulnerabilities on the continent is set to increase. And in addition, as other countries, developed countries are implementing monetary policy normalization policies, fiscal consolidation, and other policies to rein in inflation in their own countries, the spillover effects on the continent is also impacting on the cost of debt and debt repairment. All these points to a future where debt vulnerabilities may increase or is projected to be increasing on the, on the continent. As of April 20, 2022, just a few months ago, out of 38 countries that have, uh, where we have debt sustainability assessments, 16 of them were already in high risk of debt, seven were in debt distress, and 15 had a moderate, uh, to, uh, a moderate risk of debt. One point to mention here is that before COVID-19, we had the total number of countries in, uh, in debt distress to, uh, in about six. So it's increasing instead of going down. And that is for me to point to the fact that this tells me that the current measures we have in order to address the debt distress on the continent, both at the, at the African level, the national level, and the global levels need to change because it's not effective. Then another challenge is the changing composition of debt in Africa, which President Adesina has so eloquently painted for us as well. The share of private, private creditors has more than doubled from 17% in, in the year 2000 to 39% in the year 2019. And with all the fiscal challenges that countries are facing, this is only set to increase. Multilateral debt has been relatively stable at about 32.5% over the past two decades. But bilateral debt has halved to about 27% during the same period. And if you look at the composition of, the of that 27% of bilateral debt on the continent, you find that one country, China, it accounts for almost 49% of that. The United States, 15%, France, 11%, Saudi Arabia, 9%, UK, 9%, Germany, 7.5%. This in itself already tells a story about the challenges that the continent is facing and is bound to continue to face with regard to concentration of the bilateral debt to single donors, and also the multiplicity of uh, the challenges that there will be in attempting to uh, have some common framework for addressing the debt challenge, where you have a larger proportion of that with the private creditors, whose primary objective is the bottom line. Now, this is also happening at a time when Africa needs more than ever higher financing flows to address several challenges, most of which were not caused by the continent. So the growing financing needs is also bound to increase the fiscal challenges on the continent and therefore higher borrowing and higher debt vulnerabilities. To address COVID-19 uh, alone in terms of COVID recovery, the bank predicts that Africa requires about 432 billion US dollars between 2020 to 2022. And about 30, about 30 million Africans are already being pushed into extreme poverty annually. To recover from that will take the continent about a decade or more. And then if we think about another global common challenge, which is addressing uh, the uh, climate change and meeting the needs, the global needs of global sustainability as encapsulated in the, in the COP21 agreement, Africa needs up to 1.6 trillion US dollars by 2030. But what Africa is receiving so far is just 18.3 billion US dollars, leaving a financing gap of over 108 billion US dollars 
for addressing climate change alone. So why I'm painting this is that if you look at the financing needs and the rising debt, this combination it is toxic because countries will still have to finance development. And the rising debt challenges will not deter countries from dealing with the immediate and urgent development needs that they have. And this is why the African Development Bank president has painted the picture of what needs to be done in terms of ADF replenishment, more concessional financing for the continent, and the rest of it, which I will come to very briefly. I will run quickly because of time. Now, the current architecture for addressing this debt problem in the continent, on the continent, raises a number of concerns. First, I've already described the risk of continued debt stockpiling and debt default because of this toxic combination of higher financing needs and also declining concessional financing, as the president has already shared in his opening remarks. The changes in debt instruments that are being used is also creating more complex, less transparent loan terms, higher interest rates, shorter terms, and less policy conditionalities. How do you have conditionalities for a private creditor? It's really very difficult because the objective functions are different. Now, procedural clarity and justice with regard to how the common framework and other instruments are being designed and utilized is also another thing that we need to discuss in this meeting. Now, the combination of all these is that most often debt on the continent is stigmatized. So countries in debt are punished in several ways, at credit ratings, the media, civil society, and so on and so forth. Forgetting the basic principles that debt is an instrument for growing economies. It's borrowing is not the problem, but the quality of debt is the problem. So we need to really also discuss how to deal with that because quite often uh, you have you know, journalists calling, oh, this country is borrowing what is going on and so on and so forth. All countries borrow. And then it depends on how the money is utilized. But there's also the issue about common but differentiated responsibility Given what I have painted, the causes of debt on the continent is not only African. There are internal issues that countries need to deal with, improving public financial management, improving macroeconomic governance, structural reforms, and all those things that we always talk about. But then considering what finance ministers are facing, we also need to think about the other supply side challenges that is coming from you know, transparency in the creditor base, how that debt is actually contract, contracted, the, the loan terms and so on. Countries are now even being pushed to use resource-backed loans, which raises a number of challenges, which I hope we're also going to be able to discuss today. Now, the DSSI has supported, it has helped quite a lot, but it was temporary. Now, the challenges have not ended, but it has ended. So then what happened is that it has just kicked forward, kicked the can down the road, and then countries are facing more their challenges in trying to address the, the issues. Because of time, I will not go into details. The common, uh, the, the common framework for debt um, uh, services and, um, and uh, restructuring the, the G20 common framework has also similar issues because of the slow implementation, limited participation of the private creditors, which is about 40% of that um, of the creditor base for the continent, and then also getting a, agreeing on general and clear principles so that even those three countries that veered into it can be able to see the end, um, the, the light at the end of the, of the tunnel is a challenge. Because of all these, there has been very limited update. What can we do now is the subject of, the, of, the, of this meeting, of this conference, and the questions are already articulated in the concept note, so I'm not going to go through all of them. But what roles has the African Development Bank played in order to address this? The president of the bank has already addressed this question, so I'm not going to speak to this slide in detail, but the bank has conscientiously, before uh, COVID-19, identified this issue and developed instruments and frameworks and has been working proactively with the, uh, the World Bank, the IMF, and others in order to try and address it working with countries. 
What are the few recommendations I want to leave on the table for discussion? Extension of the DSSI initiative looks for me very clear that we need to do that because the challenges have not yet ended. Rechanneling SDRs and also creating new green SDRs is also something I hope we can discuss at this meeting and clarifying and fast tracking the implementation of G20 framework is now for me uh, a reputational issue because two years down the line, the G20 framework has not really achieved what it was supposed to achieve, even for countries that went in for that. More concessional financing for lower income countries, for example, using existing instruments like the ADF replenishment to, act, to ensure that these countries gain access, the much needed access to low concession, uh, to concessional financing will be critical in addressing debt distress in low income countries. We also need to promote transparency on both sides. Quite a lot we we'll hear about transparency and the mind goes to the, uh, the debtors. But we need to think about also transparency, both on the debtor and the creditor size. Enhancing collaboration and harmonization among the donors, um, donor governments in diagnostics resolution frameworks and technical assistance is also key, but we need to also coordinate both the upstream and downstream technical assistance to countries. Recon reconfiguring the global debt uh, uh, architecture is important, but for the countries themselves, we can't less rest our laurels because there's a lot that needs to be done on macroeconomic policy governance and the PFM reforms. The president has talked about using alternative and innovative financing instruments to mobilize resources is also another thing that can be done, including making natural resources work for growth on the continent. But we also need to borrow sustainably. The way that countries borrow these days uh, is something that we need to address in a, in a, uh, 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 in a very concerted uh, effort to ensure that the quality of, of, of debt is high, focusing on debt for growth and not debt for consumption. My closing words, in these times of difficulty, there are opportunities for innovation. So it might be a difficult picture to paint, but for what I see are opportunities for Africa to innovate the way it does development, and for the donor uh, partners to also innovate in the way they lend to countries so that we can have a sustainable debt platform for the continent that is good for everyone. But we cannot use our old um, map to explore the new world. Let us not continue discussion, discussion, discussion the way we have been doing it before. The global economy has changed fundamentally after COVID. And we need to actually also change the tools that we use in order to do that even if that requires redistribution of resources, for example, debt forgiveness. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Ramand. I'm sure the only discussion uh, you may want to entertain is this one, because you don't want any more discussions, 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 but I'm sure you can make uh, uh, an allowance for this one to allow us to delve into the matters you've just been touching on. Thank you so much, Professor Rama, for that IBAD's view of Africa's debt vulnerabilities, the risk of more debt stockpiling, debt default, debt stigmatization, and you spelled out strong recommendations of what needs to be done at country, regional, and international levels. Just before we go to our next speaker, let me remind you that you can post a question or send a comment anytime in writing uh, using the Q&A box. <clears throat> the chat box is the Q&A box, which is located at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And uh, due to our resource limitation, we request all audiences to kindly post the questions either in English or French. So while I stayed in the beginning that we're providing translation in English, French, Portuguese, Arabic and Japanese to post the questions in the Q&A box, please just do it in English and French. And the moderators will select relevant questions and ask panelists on behalf of you and other audiences. And as I said, we're joined by hundreds from all over the world and the others are following this discussion with hashtag TCAD8. And at the end of the event, we'll also launch a short poll uh, just to know how things will have gone and your views as well. So we'll be giving you those details as we go along. So ladies and gentlemen, help me to welcome Guillaume Chabel from the IMF. 
Guillaume, over to you. Thank you very much, Solomon, and uh, many thanks to the African Development Bank and to Japan for inviting me to this high-level uh, policy dialogue. Very timely, very important. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, ministers, governors, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It's difficult to follow uh, uh, Professor Kevin Urama given his refreshing and very enthusiastic presentation, uh, a lot of uh, 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 key uh, elements and food for thoughts. Um, um, uh, Kevin described very rightly the trends and challenges and the technologies in Africa, so I will not, of course, elaborate on this. Just wanted to echo that indeed the challenges were already high before COVID. They have been further exacerbated by COVID. They are now again on the rise due to the war in Ukraine and the related spillovers. But as Kevin mentioned rightly, uh, there are structural issues, there are huge needs associated to development, to climate uh, change, to uh, security, to uh, poverty alleviation, et cetera. And, and this has to be uh, addressed, of course. It, it is true that Africa is not the only region to face, to face these challenges. Worldwide, about 60% of the 73 countries that were eligible in 2020 and 2021 to the debt service uh, suspension initiative, the DSSI, are also assessed at high risk or already in the distress, which is almost the same ratio uh, as for Africa. And I think it would be also very important to underline that not all African countries are in the same uh, place. Uh, there are, of course, differentiation, but of course, uh, as Kevin again mentioned, um, uh, there are high debt vulnerabilities uh, in the region. Um, I think Kevin mentioned the fact that among the 38 African DSSI countries, more than 20 are at high risk of, uh, of the distress, are already in the distress. Among them, Chad, Ethiopia, and Zambia have undertaken a debt restructuring under the G20 common framework. Somalia is implementing the HEPIC initiative. So I would like to briefly recall some key features of the G20 Common Framework and then turn to the experience and lessons so far with this uh, Common Framework. So as you know, the G20 Common Framework uh, for debt treatments beyond the DSSI was agreed in November 2020 by the G20 and the Paris Club to address the challenges of DSSI eligible countries beyond the liquidity relief that was provided by the DSSI. And indeed, it was a key breakthrough because for the first time ever, we had Paris Club creators such as the US, France, the UK, Germany, Japan, and others, but also non-Paris Club official bilateral creators, including China, India, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and others, jointly uh, 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 addressing uh, together the situation of countries requesting a debt restructuring. So uh, overcoming a divide that had been identified for years as a major impediment to efficient debt restructuring. And it was extremely important as given um, the change in crypto composition that Kevin underlined, crypto coordination among official bilateral creditors was made much more complicated and was uh, much needed to ensure timely and orderly debt restructuring. So very practically, any of the 73 countries worldwide of the 38 countries in Africa that were eligible to the DSSI in 2020 and 2021, and that would need to restructure the debt, can do so under the G20 common uh, framework. For each country requesting such a treatment, a country-specific creditor committee would be formed, which would gather all G20 and all Paris Club creditors of the country and all other official bilateral creditors willing to join the creditor committee. And the debt restructuring would be done in the context of an IMF program with the need for the debt treatment and the size of the restructuring envelope that is required would be based on an IMF World Bank debt sustainability analysis and would be consistent with the parameters of the IMF program. Private credit participation is also a key feature of uh, the common framework. The DSSI, as we remember, didn't include a participation of the private creditors or more rightly, the participation of private creditors was purely voluntary and it did, didn't work. For the common framework, that's very different because the participation of the private creditors is a requirement under the common framework, is ensured through the implementation of the clause of comparability of treatment, which basically replicates what has worked well for decades uh, with the price club. And in practice, I'll come back to that later, we don't see major issues there. So turning to the actual implementation of the common framework, 
I agree completely uh, with what Kevin said, which is that progress has been very limited so far. Even though uh, it would be also fair to say that we have seen tangible signs of improvements in the past few months. So there are signs for hope that we should uh, uh, build and, implement and improve this momentum. So since the beginning of the common framework 18 months ago, only three countries have requested the treatment under the common framework, Chad, Ethiopia, and Zambia, and no that treatment has been fully completed yet. That said, it would be also fair to say that Chad and Zambia could benefit through this process of what we call the provision of financing assurances from creditors, which is the commitment from official bilateral creditors to provide a debt relief that is in line with the parameters of an IMF program. And thanks to these financing assurances, indeed, the IMF board could approve the IMF program for Chad in December last year. And as you know, is about to consider the program for Zambia now that the official credit committee for Zambia delivered its financing assurances in July. And we clearly have from the two ministers, uh, of course, of their own assessment of the process, which is very, very important. The next step for Chad and for Zambia is for the official bilateral creditors to finalize the agreement on the debt relief consistent with the parameters of the IMF program. So bottom line, the, the mechanism is delivering, but is delivering very slowly and insufficiently efficiently. So definitely improvements are urgently needed. This would increase confidence in the mechanism, facilitate the decision by other to do it, and be aligned with the severe situation of debt vulnerabilities many countries are facing. Um, but we don't think the framework itself needs major changes. What we think is that targeted improvements could make a considerable difference and make the framework indeed deliver up to its potential. As you know, the uh, IMF, together with the World Bank, has proposed four targeted improvements. The first one is to clarify the timelines and processes to provide everyone, the debtor, the creditors, the other stakeholders, with predictability, transparency about the process. Developing a publicly available compendium of timelines and steps in the process would help a lot everyone, in particular the countries facing debt vulnerabilities and hesitating to request a debt treatment. Second, we believe that a debt service suspension for the duration of the negotiation should be introduced. It would improve significantly the mechanism. It would provide a liquidity relief to the debtor precisely at the time where the uh, country is very much under financial stress. It could be factored in in the uh, actual treatment at the end of the process. And uh, if it were adequately shaped, which is technically feasible, it would provide the appropriate incentives to move the negotiation quickly forward, both for the debtor and the creditors. Third, on creditor on private sector participation, what we think is that, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, we don't see a major problem with uh, private rate of participation under the common framework for the reason that the uh, traditional financial private creditors know very well how the rules are meant to be implemented. I think there is a bit of a confusion in the public domain, uh, given that under the DSSI, it was clear from the onset that the official bilateral creditors decided not to uh, uh, require private sector participation. So private sector partition, participation was purely voluntary and as one could have expected, didn't, didn't uh, work. Um, we have a case also which is very specific, which is CHAD, where the issue is not so much the private creator of CHAD having uh, you know, some uh, slowness in terms of implementing the debt treatment that it required, but the fact that the contract that CHAD and the key private creator of CHAD have signed is very, very specific, collateralized, with basically the impossibility for Chad, uh, it would be for the minister to explain, of course, I may be wrong, but our understanding is that Chad cannot run arrears vis-a-vis -vis its uh, key private creditor, which of course gives the private creditor a very, very strong leverage in the negotiations. That's not uh, what we see in other cases, including Zambia, for instance, where Zambia is already in arrears with its private creditors. And again, I'm re very much looking forward to hear the views of uh, the Minister for Zambia uh, on the situation. So we don't see, uh, example, a major uh, issue with private sector participation under the common framework, but definitely we think that it would be very welcome for official bilateral creditors and for the G20 
to clarify the stance and to clarify how comparability of treatment will be enforced in practical terms, because the past months have been, you know, um, um, kind of um, uh, perturbated uh, by, by a debate which wasn't very helpful on whether or not private sector participation would work under the uh, common framework. That's not our assessment, but again, having this clarity would help the debate move forward. Lastly, uh, 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 as I mentioned earlier, only 73 countries worldwide and only 38 countries in Africa can request a debt restructuring under the common framework. And we know, of course, that there are other countries that would also need a debt treatment and where critical coordination would be key. I don't have a specific example to give for Africa, but uh, a key example nowadays is Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka needs a debt restructuring. Coordination among official budget operators, uh, such as Paris Club members and China and India, would be key. And having such a coordinated approach would make a strong difference for the country. So, um, um, in the interest of time, I just wanted to, to recap that we see uh, small, targeted, but very, very important improvements. We see those improvements are realistic, can be achieved, should be achieved. We really hope they will be. As I mentioned, we have seen a bit of improvements over the past few months, um, in, including on the way Paris Club and non Paris Club creators interact and on the efficiency of the processes. There has been in June and July many meetings of all of the three creator committees of Chad, for Ethiopia, and for Zambia. So there is some momentum, but we uh, would like this momentum to accelerate and to deliver indeed up to the potential of the common framework. Many thanks again for having this opportunity to engage, and I would be very happy, of course, if there are questions that I could address later on. Many thanks. Over to you, Solomon. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Guillaume Chabot from uh, uh, IMF. And yes, you're asking for questions and comments. They are coming in in that Q&A box. They are really coming in. I would urge everybody to use that box to send us your questions and comments. Uh, you've heard from Professor Rama earlier on, and then you are hearing from uh, Mr. Guillaume Chabel. So you've got the best brains in the room to tackle those questions and comments.